Hello dear viewer. What we are looking at here is a mid-70s 706 horsepower outboard. It's a pretty pretty basic motor. Um, they're everywhere. Um, no thrills. Just just a pull start old Ford reverse six horse. It's pretty common. Now this video will appeal to all 1979 and prior six horsepowers, 5.5 horsepowers, and 7.5 horsepowers. They're all pretty pretty much the same. It's the shape of this exhaust housing, really what you want to look at. If it has an exhaust housing, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, they're pretty good motors. They are very common. They are everywhere. There's probably hundreds of thousands a year of these things made, and they are everywhere. You can get them pretty cheap. Uh, most people see a six horse. They figure it's too small to really do much, and they, they sell them cheap, which is good because boating is expensive. If you can save some money, great. Uh, six horsepower, they're not that bad. It'll push a small aluminum boat with two large men in it between 8 and 11 miles an hour. Propped correctly, trimmed correctly, and weight distribution of the boat done correctly. You can get it moving. Now, obviously, you're not going to be taking them on, you know, open ocean island hopping, but around your local uh, waterway, sure, no problem only real issue that they pretty much all suffer from is the broken shift handle on the side most of the time you're gonna see a pair of vice grips clamped on there that works fine but I'm gonna uh, replace this one just to just to keep it nice now what's special about this six horse well not much it's been baking out in the desert Sun for probably its whole life but when we look under the hood this thing looks new. It it is quite nice. I mean, look at the look at the rope, the starter spool, the brass, the paint, the cylinder head, the uh, ignition wire clamp. The only thing that's really been changed on it is the uh, fuel line clamps. Otherwise, it looks all original under this thing. So it should be a nice little candidate to do a full overhaul on. Now, with any old used junkie outboard. First thing you want to do is check for spark and compression. You don't want to find out that you're working with a dead motor. And spark, just because you're doing compression, you might as well do spark at the same time. Now, ideally here, you'd use a spark gap checker to see how far of a gap the spark will jump. But I usually just use a uh, one of the neon light type spark testers just to, just to see if there's any life. Uh, bottom plug looks uh, pretty crummy. Top plug looks about equal, so no troubles there. We do have a little bit of oily substance leaking out of there, perhaps from a failed startup attempt. Now usually here you would want to use the uh, rewind starter and just give it a couple of pulls, see how the compression is. But my bench doesn't allow me to get behind it, so I just wrap a rope around the flywheel. Which is kind of annoying, but it works fine. Alright, we have 90 PSI on top and bottom cylinder. Both were right in the same spot, so perfect there. Uh, spark on both cylinders, which doesn't mean much, but it's good. Oh, 90? Usually I see 80 on good running little six horses of this this vintage. So 90, I think we're going to have an easy to start well running, well idling motor. Um, there is a few different ways you could go about this repair, which I think I will try to discuss as we go. But as, as far as right now goes, we don't know what it needs. We may just be able to put gas in it and have it fire right up. If that's the case, great. But... We don't know how old our carburetor kit slash float slash how clean it is inside. We don't know the age of our fuel lines. We don't know the age of our fuel pump. Guarantee ourselves we should change out the lower crankcase seal. The water pump should be replaced. And we don't know the condition of the lower unit oil slash gear slash seals. All of that stuff we should check out before we head out on the open water. So we're going to go through this motor. Okay. Let's get the camera up angle a little bit. There you go. And we will get the power head off. You will see why shortly. Um, starter rope's a little, a little loose. Probably stretched out as the years went on, so 
just going to cut the handle. The starter doesn't work anyway. No biggie. Well, it might work. Use a pair of needle nose to try to gently remove the idle knob. Came right off. Unscrew the idle needle. Grommet inside of the hood pan's falling apart. No big deal. Well, while we're here, unclip the throttle. There's a tiny cotter pin inside a little pin for the choke. Got to bend that out, take out the pin, just like so. Off comes our choke arm. Now the throttle is going to get replaced anyway, or at least the throttle. Fuel lines are going to get replaced, so I'm just going to cut them off. So now all the external stuff of our power head is no longer a factor. So now we can unbolt it. Now some years are going to have different size nuts. Early years, these are 3 8 and the bolt head is so close to the exhaust housing it's really difficult to get it out. In later years, they went to a smaller 5 16 head, which means we can get a socket right in there. Now, on early, early years, this is going to be a, a, a slotted screwdriver. The reason I like the later 70s ones is simply because of the hardware they choose. If you notice where I'm, gonna, where I'm getting to get into here to get this lower mount out, or this lower bolt out, easy with that. Slotted, pretty hard to get in there. So that's it for that side. Yeah, I always forget something. So that didn't quite cut the fuel line all the way. There we go. And with the power head off, we can see our lower crankcase seal. Here's our upper washer, our seal plate. Our little carbon washer and our o-ring followed by the spring and down in the bottom you can see our little lower retainer plate which will be a little more clear in a second there it is and now if I angle the camera a little better you can see why I took the power head off to get off the lower not that I explained what I was doing, I just kind of did it. But, you see these little tiny slots? They got a line right down inside of there. Now, I did get lucky right now, as it already aligns. But let me shift it in forward and spin the propeller. You can see it pretty easily to not align those. You know, if you're right there, you can pull. You want that lower's not coming off. But if you go right about there, it comes off that issue. So let's get this lower off. By having the unit shifted into forward, it pulled up the shift rod here, which means I can pretty easily get to it. Flathead rarely works. Usually, a socket is a better idea. You can't just loosen it, you gotta pull it all the way out. Widen it with the flathead just a pinch to make life easy. And off she comes. Oh, 
before going any further, I want to pull off this roll pin because at some point I'm going to slide my hand up this drive shaft and that thing's going to cut me. I've done it many times. It's really annoying. Uh, different ways to get that out. I find the easiest is just to use a tiny socket pressed underneath there and get a hammer to get it started. But some penetrating oil also helps out quite a bit. So it moved. Usually they're not that easy. Usually it takes a bit of force to get them to move. But once you move it back and forth, there's a pretty good chance it's free. Then you can get in there with a nail or something, hammer it out the rest of the way. in the fixture make life easy loosen these now spray these down and hope they don't get stuck on us let's pull the top vent first that screw is completely dry bottom and we have nice decently clean oil coming out of there that's the first well that drains let's see if our water pump will come off first one no problem problems the second one's cool third is groovy and fourth far out. Okay, lower unit. Nice oil came out, which probably means that it's not leaking. However, that's not a sure thing. There's two things here. Before I went and bought this motor, Prior owner could have went and put nice new clean oil in it for us. That's possible. You know, you gotta beauty up your wares when you're trying to sell them. So you can't rule that out. Secondly, this engine probably hasn't been in the water in 20 or 30 years. So we don't know if those seals are still gonna be any good. And if they're not, they're still very old. Let's not forget about that. But just for kicks, I'm going to pressurize the gear case and see if we are leaking anywhere. While that sits, let's tend to the carburetor. To remove the carburetor, simply remove that nut, that nut, fuel line, you're home free. Problem is, getting to that nut behind the starter can't happen with the starter in the way. So we need to pull the starter off. Like most small engines, that is the fun part. Now we have these small 516 bolts on top of the starter. The bolt's not a 516. Probably a quarter twenty, but the bolt head itself is a five sixteenth. Check the lower bushing. Yeah, it's a pretty nice spring. All the way around. Lower bushing looks pretty nice too. You can see it right there. If that wears away, it needs to be replaced. But we're not even worn there, so. I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. 
can see here how that is installed. So if you pull yours off and forget, you can come back and look at mine. Just pull this top screw out for the throttle cam. Throttle cam comes off as does this little nut. Remove it. It's a 7 16 wrench and we can pull off these bolts. Gasket looks okay, looks a little crushed. What you'd expect from being crushed when it was installed. Let's pop the fuel bubble off. Bottom of the bowl is nice and clean. We have the original cork float, looks to be properly adjusted, and looks to be working fine. So all in all, carburetor probably doesn't need anything, but we're gonna do it anyway. Carburetor kit, it's like 20 bucks, so it's nothing really to skimp on. And apparently that, new, that cork float in there, once it sees our modern ethanol fuel, it just starts getting eaten up. So I'm going to leave that in and hope soaking it in a card cleaner will loosen that little gasket seal out of there. Card cleaner, let it soak in there for a little while. Now you could take the reeds off here and go in for a look. I mean, take the intake manifold and go in for a look at the reeds. While you're here, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but I can see them halfway decently with the light on from the camera. I don't see any corrosion or dirt or anything on there, so I'm not gonna worry about tearing into the reeds. All right, I'm gonna get the flywheel off, have a look at the ignition. interesting usually you don't get stuck on small ones all right we have halfway decent coils in there those are 80s vintage it looks like uh, no cracks they look fine the components they look all pretty nice I don't think we should replace these coils I mean really there's Nothing really wrong looking with them. They, they look okay. All right, just because I have some time to do it, might as well do it now. I'm going to spray some tap and dye cutting oil into the holes. I have a tap socket. I'm gonna run a tap down these holes to chase slash clean up the threads. All right, let's address the shift handle in the room. It is broken, we all know this. We don't want it to look rigged with vice grips. We really don't. So I'm gonna remove it, fix it, change it, swap it, whatever words you wanna use. Uh, to do that, we need to get this up, upper shift rod connector out of here. Let me slide you over a little bit. That's exactly what I'm looking at, nice and clean. Uh, pretty simple to do. We remove this, 
connector comes off, there is a small washer behind it, and the shift rod can move out of the way. There is a very good chance this bolt's going to break. Very good. A lot of heat and exhaust and water and all kinds of junk coming out right on top of this screw. It's pretty tight. Unexpected. We do whatever we can not to break it. means heating it up, so be it. Heating it all also burns off all of the uh, corrosion too. Or not corrosion, but grease and stuff, making it look a little cleaner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's, let's call that good. We don't want to bake our paint off either. So it's moving, but we don't know if that's because it's coming off or if it's stripping. Let's sizzle some more of this stuff out of there. Hope that did something. Just going to go back and forth with it, try to get it good and free. And it feels loose enough to where it's either broken or it's going to come out. Try to get a better size flathead in there now that it's looser. And it feels like it's moving. Now if this was a good handle, this would be even more important. Now this shift rod connector is available new. So if something does happen, you're, you're not uh, too bad of shape. But if you don't have to spend money, don't. So there's our slightly warm screw. I think that's the best angle you're getting. So I'm going to slide out the old broken shift rod if I can. Should almost be there. Let's give a little help. All right, shift rod connector is loose, so I can go in there with the pick, slide it out, and grab this little washer before I lose it. Very thin washer, not something you're going to stroll down to the local blue store and get. Shift handle is out, as is our little shift indicator, which I have no idea what this thing is for. Like really, it does absolutely nothing in this motor, but they're still here. I think it's because the... Uh, Probably the, uh, not even the fives. The fours and the fives don't even use this thing. But see, that hole, I imagine, is for some kind of return spring or detent spring. Maybe there's some kind of kit or something you would install and it would use that. I have no idea, but it's just there. All right, here is our new shift handle. As you can see, it came, somebody, whoever replaced this handle at some point in their life, also had to buy a new shift rod connector, probably because their screw broke. And this is the newer design. And it is a beauty. Here is our old one. Standard cast aluminum with a hole tapped into it. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. This thing. CNC machined. Just an absolute beauty. They're, they're not cheap, they're expensive, but just, just great. Okay, let's take a look at our two shift rods here. Shift handles. You can tell they are a little different. This has that little slot there. The older one does not. This one being the older one. This little slot aligns with this little mystery piece that I don't know what it does. It slides in there. And this rotates with the handle. No provisions for it on this one. None at all. Just That's kind of just what it does. It won't work. Reason being, those little tabs can't go into the handle. Unless you go in there and cut the tabs down, then, then you're good. Look at that. Like it was made to fit. 
Let's go ahead and get some grease on this new shaft. Now, if you notice, there is an O-ring in here. Yes, that O-ring does matter. That's going to keep exhaust gases from going out and hitting the handle. So you want to make sure that's in good shape. Or just cover it in grease. Your call. So, can you just go ahead and swap out parts at random like this? I mean, can you use an older shift handle on newer motor? No. Can you use a newer shift handle on an older motor? No. They, need, they are your specific. Unless you come do what I'm doing, then no problems. Am I an advocate for rigging up outboards? No. But that handle was once easily replaceable. Granted, at a very high cost, but you could just go buy one for 80 bucks. Inventory is long dried up, and now you're stuck to getting old used ones off the interwebs. What you want may not be available at the time. So, you're pretty much getting whatever you can. And, I am no different. I don't have one of those new fancy ones that'll fit. So, I'm rigging in this thing. Does it matter? I don't think so. Yeah, and getting the shift rod back in there, it's... Usually not the easiest thing to do, but... Threads aren't quite lining up. Need to wedge something in there while pushing the handle in. Get that screw started. There's a spring on the back of the handle. That, that likes to fight you. There we go. Perfect. Okay, the old water pump. Uh, it's really not in that bad of shape. Yeah, we got some corrosion and pitting and stuff going on along with the circular rings in there. So it, I mean, the housing has some life left in, but you can definitely tell it's got a lot of wear too. The impeller itself has a lot of these, what look like dry rubs, where it was just overheating and rubbing itself. So somebody probably fired this thing up out of the water. Our veins are also permanently bent over. And the water pump wear plate, it's it's fine, but housing and impeller need to get changed, so we're going to order a new kit. New old kit is here. Uh, 391391 is the one and only part number I've ever memorized. That is the water pump for a six horse. However, this is long discontinued and superseded with a new version of it. Uh, you do not want to order a 391391 because it is, it is just very old. This one seems to be in good shape. Our veins are okay, nice and pliable. So we're going to go ahead and roll with it. However, you can tell our box has some, some age to it, as is our little lower gasket thing here. Housing itself should have no issues. It's a, it's a nice, pretty clean unit. And our little hardware pack. Looks to all be complete. So anyway, those washers I'll put on. We have a new little water pump key, a new old gasket, and a new water rear plate. So all in all, should have everything we need. It looks like a nice good pump. We shouldn't need any types of crazy sealants on this thing. We should just need to kind of put it together. All right. First and foremost, there is no good way to do this. If you follow the instructions to a T, it won't pump water. I don't know if it's just an age thing or what, but instructions say to install the wear plate there, screw it down and assemble the rest. The problem is when you put that wear plate there, it won't pump water. You need some type of sealant between the wear plate and the little lower bearing plate. Now, I don't know if that's age and corrosion causing this lower uh, plate to have just the smallest of little air gaps, so it sucks air instead of water, or if it's just they left it out of the repair manuals, and when they 
time went on and they didn't rewrite it, just slightly modified them, that, that little note never really gets put in there. Uh, if you look on the bottom of the wear plate, the old one, it's debatable. Was there something on there or is that just gunk built up? Most of the time you can see little strings of, of some type of sealant coming off. Sometimes you can't. But believe me when I say this, this needs some type of sealant down. Now I usually just use RTV, whatever I have on hand, honestly. It just needs something to create a little air seal there. Since I have some of this fancy 3M, uh, what is this stuff called, 847, which is what oh, every water pump on every motor larger than this one, the instruction manual is called for, I'm going to use that. Like I said, it's just these, these smaller older ones where this little step kind of got forgotten ignored or I'm not sure maybe it didn't originally need it because it was just that close tolerances on that bottom plate but it doesn't pump anymore I've done many of these where if that's not sealed it does not pump so it needs something down there let's put in our key rotate it to the other side away from the uh, water intake hole so you don't drop it in there Key get in there. Now, should you have to bang it in there? No. What you should have to do is go in here with some pliers and push it in like that. That's how you're supposed to do it. Center this just a bit. Let's slide down our impeller. mates right there perfectly a little bit of spray on our pump housing now some people are saying oh no you need to use soap or some people are gonna say oh no you need to use two-stroke oil or some people are gonna say oh no you can't use oil oil hurts the impeller veins look depends on Different water pump kits, I've noticed, say they need different things. So as time has gone on, I've stopped caring. Whatever's within my reach is what I'm using to lube that up before I slide it down. It's really, really not an issue. So I'm rotating the drive shaft with a little wrench clockwise while holding down this impeller cup. And we are good and seated there. By the way, if you're curious, the 10 millimeter wrench fits perfectly on the veins. So, should need to go right about there. That looks about right. Now we need some Johnson Evinrude gasket and sealing compound. Problem is, I am slightly out of it at the moment. So I'm going to use some Forma Gasket non-pliable hardener sealer on this base gasket instead of the sealing compound. I don't know if this is going to be a good idea or a bad idea, but we will find out when we start it up, I guess. Just like so. There. Slide down our water pump. It should meet on there nicely. Perfect. Now our screws and washers. Going to put some of this stuff on the threads to make sure they don't seize in there. Check for proper rotation. Make sure there's no binding. Oh, feels good and smooth. Put a heaping dab of the non-hardening pliable sealant onto this. 
water tube grommet. Oh, by the way, the whole time I was working on the uh, other stuff here, the gear case was being pressurized slash tested, and it never leaked a, a drop. So, rather than, I'm not going to reseal it. I don't think it's needed. Basically, these screws came out a little, a little cruddy. So I'm going to run the tap down them to make sure there's no issues. So, I don't know if everybody caught a roll pin removal and why it was needed. Aside from possibly cutting your hand open on it, you also need to remove it to remove the water pump. So, keep that in mind, you're removing a roll pin. I'm going to put a dab of grease onto the hole here where the roll pin goes, because if that roll pin seizes in there, it sucks. Getting it out of there is just a nightmare if it breaks off. So, put some grease in there to help prevent that in the future. Getting this thing back in here usually isn't that fun. Because you got to line it and then hit it at the same time. So I have this pair of self-closing pliers. It'll help me hold it into position in theory. You piece of junk, just stay put. I mean, once you get it started, it's fine. Make sure it's about halfway in, which I would say it's nearly there. Maybe one more little tap. That was too far. Right there. You want it on a, a horizontal plane, I think. Just up and down like that. Okay, when we put this back in here, we need to align the drive shaft through the drive shaft hole, the shift rod connector onto the shift rod shaft, and the water pump pickup, which you can't see, but it's right back here, onto the water tube drop. You got to do all that at the same time, and there's not enough room to get your hand screwdriver or be able to see what you're doing. So, drive shaft goes into a little little round slot. That'll slide up and allow you to get it back into its spot. That's in. Now I can see I'm putting the water tube back into its spot, and now I'm just guiding in the lower. So we're all okay there. Now I'm using the shift rod to push the lower down just a pinch. Shift handle, I mean. Which gives us just enough view to be able to see if we are aligned with the shift rod connector screw. And this part's going to be fun too. So, rotate a little bit. Slide in the screw, get your needle nose out of the way if you can. Come in there with a flat head, smaller one. Get the screw started. the larger one. Hope that when you just slid it back a little bit you didn't do anything. And push it in. And hope we're okay. I've cleaned up the lower hardware. Nice and clean now. We put some triple guard gasket sealing compound grease onto the screws to make sure they don't seize in there.
Now a little bit of grease into the propeller shaft pinhole as well as the propeller shaft itself. Now it is time for our lower crankcase seal. Our little plate goes down first, cup up so that the spring fits in there nicely. We now need our little cup, but we need to take out and replace the O-ring. This O-ring may be an off-the-shelf size, but they're cheap enough to just order it when you're ordering the rest of the parts. I'm going to put some triple guard grease on there just because. Doesn't service manual doesn't mention this, but I figured it couldn't hurt. I'm going to slide our greasy O-ring into our little shaft. Don't think I want grease on the top. Because I think it's supposed to slide a little bit. And it already popped right out, which is normal. We'll use our plate to push it down. Yeah, perfect. Speaking of plate, that little side up, we need to replace this thing. That cork little gasket is right here. Uh, zero, three, zero, three, three, five, five. Piece cake. There's our new little cork seal. Okay, powerhead time. We need to get our old gasket off of here, which with any luck will come off in one piece. Get it out. For how hard it is, it's not. So that's going to be fun. All right, I have cleaned the gasket surfaces up on the power head, ran a tap down in the holes, so we're good to install again. I'm gonna put some Molly Lube onto the drive shaft splines to make sure that our drive shaft doesn't seize into our crankshaft. Just the sides, not the top. Get some on that cork gasket, I wouldn't worry about it. Cork gasket's gonna see uh, oil anyway. All right, now for a gasket. If you are ordering yourself this stuff separately, like doing the water pump and wanna change the seal because you should change it while you're doing a water pump, you also need to order one of these gaskets. Sierra sells them as well as obviously OEM. Buy an OEM one, it's like nine bucks for one. Buy a Sierra one, it's like $8.99 for two. So you might as well get the two in case you screw something up and need to do this again. I have a powerhead gasket set for a six horsepower, which comes with our new lower gasket. Okay, gasket. Let's go ahead and put it on. Pretty easy to decipher how it goes because of that huge hole there. So that's how that goes. Now let's lower on our power head, which shouldn't be hard to align. There we go. Down she goes. 
All of our hardware is the same length except for this one, which goes behind the other one that is still inside of the powerhead. Uh, these four, I'll put right in and I'll show you where this one goes. Also, I'll be putting some uh, anti-C slash grease slash ga gasket sealing compound on those to make sure they don't get stuck. With the powerhead balancing there, I can't tilt it up. So I'll be doing all this from underneath. You gotta get one started and another one in to make sure the gasket is gonna stay aligned. Okay, we have two different screws, this one above this mount and the one right behind it. That uses the longer one as well. Now that all of my screws are in, and I know my power head will go on just fine, so I will make another pass and tighten all this stuff down. All right, carburetor is back from the cleaning solution and then washing and drying. So we have a nice, good carburetor base to start with. Cleaned up the needle and the other brass parts. So they are ready for install. Carb kit is right here. Part number uh, 439071. We have a new float arm right here. There's our float valve and seat. Maybe I'll clean this out first. Hit it with some carb cleaner. It always works. All right, I have a piece of wire down inside of the back of the carburetor. We have these two little holes. Those are our idle jet passages. What I'm gonna do is get my little piece of wire, stick them through those holes. Make sure air slash my wire gets through there. And that's all I really need to do there. Uh, soaking it in the gasket, gasket, the uh, carb cleaner, did remove the inner gasket from inside of that hole. So there's no troubles there. And I can see all the way down there, there's no debris or anything weird going on. That little idle jet right there is good and clear. So no troubles there. Uh, from here to here is one huge hole. Uh, the carb cleaner that I just sprayed through there showed me that there's no obstructions in there. And then we have this hole there, which I can't get anything down, but I can see down to the throat of the carburetor, and there's nothing in there. So I would say our carburetor is good and ready for rebuilding. Now when you open a carburetor up and it looks like this, you're, you're in good, good standing, I'd say. When you open it up and it's full of sand and salt water or whatever, that's when I would pop off this cap, make sure everything is all nice and clean. Don't need to. This thing looks fine. I'm going to leave that in there. Call my wire. We call that probing. We'll call that good. The main jet is down in here. You can either shove the wire like I did or get one of these fancy dancy jet screwdrivers. Pull that out and have a look-see at her. Back the jet looks clear. I can see right through it. No debris or anything weird going on, both inside and outside. So I would say we're good to go here too. Let's get this thing back together. I remove this brass thing. Its holes are nice and clear. Snug that guy down. Good to go there. Put in our float valve. Do 
use our float valve screwdriver tool. It's good to go there. Get our float and our spring. What we want is that to be good and parallel. As you can see, we are not good and parallel. So we need to adjust the arm. That. All right, we are good to go. We have a float gauge, which you don't really need. You can just eyeball it. But we are right in the marks, so we are good. need to get this little guy right there. It goes right here. Let's get our float. Gasket, float bowl gasket, whatever you want to call it. Now we need my pick. We need to get this little tiny little red seal right there. This goes on our drain screw or our main jet access hole, whatever you'd consider this thing to be. Okay, we're good there. Now we need some packing needles. So this carburetor kit fits many different carburetors. On some 6 horsepower, 5.5s, 7.5s, you're going to have adjustable high and adjustable high speed and low speed needle. On this here we have a fixed high speed but an adjustable low. We have 6 packing nuts, which means we need 3 on each needle or 3 for the entire carburetor here leaving us three spares. So one, two, and three. I have a section of my mill spec fuel line here. Which I'm going to install on the barb before I put the carburetor on to make life easy. Now with the six horse you can easily get to these so you don't really need to do this but it's already out in your hand, you might as well. There's our fuel line. Let's get fancy fused fuel line hose clamp here. There we go. Let's put on our new gasket and our carburetor slash fuel line. Now I have one of these grommets, so I'm going to replace this. If you didn't, usually you can go to your local hardware store and pick up one of the grommets that looks like an O-ring with a little slot in it. You can replace it with one of those. It's, you know, a few cents, 50 cents or whatever they cost. This one's original, so it's old, and I'm probably going to break it getting it in there, but might as well give it a try. Let's 
screw in our needle. Feels like it's going fine. Looking for it to bottom out. Should be getting close now. Alright, it's bottomed out there. So let's go ahead and take it out. Let's go give us half a turn. Our kit does come with a new cotter pin, so use it if you want. But I'm reinstalling the choke arm or knob. As I didn't test this fuel pump, I'm not going to put a clamp on this fuel pump just yet. I'm just going to hook up the line. And if we don't have any troubles, I'll clamp it down. Otherwise, this will hold it on there just fine. There's not enough pressure to blow this tube off. Alright, might as well do the lower line now. I'm going to pull the screw off right there. I've been using this mil spec fuel line so far. It's pretty nice. It's pliable, easy to cut, goes right onto things. Time will tell how long it'll last, but I think it'll last just fine. forgot the cam follower. Don't want to forget that. A little tricky to throttle up your outboard without this thing on here. Actually, while that's off, I check the timing. Which I think is I think is pretty far off. Uh, maybe not. No, we're fine. There's a tiny groove, which is pretty worn down. But right here, there's a little line. When you throttle it up, the follower pickup here needs to just touch that line, and when it hits it any further, it needs to just start moving, which it does right on time. So we're okay in our timing. No adjustment needed there. Now you may ask yourself too, well why don't you why don't you adjust it while you're here? Now sometimes it's better to leave well enough alone. You'd probably work the way it is there, especially the motor like you know in this kind of condition. I find it best not to mess with it. Now we should get some new starter rope, but I'm not going to. And maybe I will. Let's see if I have some. All right, I don't actually have any starter rope, but that's something that can get changed afterwards quite easily without removal of the power head, so I'm not going to worry about it. This is our starter rope guide. Many six horsepowers I see where a person has tried to fix the repair of the starter themselves, so that is missing. I think they see it as a, a random rod and they don't need it in there. It absolutely does need to be in there. It guides the rope back onto the spool. I think most of the problems people have with these starters is that rod missing. All right, our spring. The spool has a slot down there. If that slot's broken, you need a new spool. The spring, spool, engages into that slot. If there's a problem with the spring or if this is bent, 
you need a new spring. This lower half clips in down there. I may have to pull the lower thing off here to get this to engage again. There's two different ways that these starter springs can and do work. One way is it goes into that bottom lower slot. The spring comes around and clips on or clips on that way. The other scenario is it hangs off to the side and when you tighten the screws down, it pinches it up there and holds the spring on. I think the in and clip is the newer where the outer clip is the older. My spring is the outer clip variety, so it sits in there like that. So that when I put it in there and install it, it holds this bottom piece down. It's not, I don't like it as much as the type that go inside down there, but it, it works. The problem with this type is getting it in there because you kind of got to push the spring down to make sure it holds in while you get this plate started. So it's not. It's not as user friendly as the twist and turn type. What ears use what? I have no idea. Twist and turn type may even be an aftermarket spring. By the way, that spring's pretty common. You used to be able to just go to Napa and buy them, or order them rather. Probably not going to have them in stock unless you live by a marina. And even then, these engines are so old, they're probably not stocking them anymore. So that is pretty much all there is to that. That spring can flop around and do its thing in there. Let's get our starter rope guide back in. Put in our starter. And twist until we get the lower thing to engage, which usually you can feel it. Or see it like my just case there's now. Let me go twist up and spin this in and down. There's a small hole in the back of this black plastic thing that our guide rope rod will fall into. You can do all this without the uh, with the flywheel on too, it's just a little harder. So here is the starter handle that came out of here. I don't believe this is original. I think this has been changed. I think originally it would have had a smaller version of it. I, I could be wrong, but the reason I don't like using these is when they sit in the front of the motor, they're so heavy, they kind of flop down and ride along with you like this. I like them to sit where they're supposed to, out and up like that. I don't think this one is going to do it, but this is what I have. I should have done this in the first place instead of cutting the rope because I'm not losing just a knot end. I'm losing all of this rope here, so probably six inches of rope, which doesn't sound like much, but it is because we're probably not going to have rope on this bottom two little windings here. We'll find out. All right, there is a whole process to winding this starter. Uh, I don't really want to get into it because you don't really need it because you're supposed to pop that roll pin out rotate it but you don't need to you can hold the pinion down put a huge flathead on the top and spin it just fine you know what I mean so you know, rotate it I believe it's 13 and a half turns but I'm just gonna rotate it till it gets pretty taunt Nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. So we're at 13 there anyway, and it's pretty taut. You don't want to overdo it either.
get the rope through. What's nice about this, you don't have to tie a knot. Definitely got that going for it. See what I mean about not getting rope on the bottom? But do we really care? So interesting tidbit here about this flywheel. It looks like these have coil inserts. So somebody had troubles with this thing previously. All right, flywheel nut torque is 40 to 45 foot-pounds. I'm going to be using a torque-limiting impact socket on this. This makes life easy. That's it right there. There is a certain online boats website where you can buy parts from. On that website, if you spend over $149, you get free shipping. Now there are times where I come out to 148 and some change, and I have nothing else to add. I can add a t-shirt or some, a pen or a cup holder or something, but rather not just throw money away on things I don't need. So what I do is I add on some of these things. There's the part number if you're curious. These are the new gaskets for the screws, which every time you take these out, you should change. What a lot of people say they use is uh, they cut up milk jugs and make their own. You can try that or just add some on to your order. Yeah, either way. I have an old bottle. Oh, it's old. It's been sitting around forever. Oh, you know. Okay, so this is actually, I think, type C. Oh, whatever. Anyway, I'm using it. So, this bottle should fill that hole over here. I haven't bought these in a long time for this reason. It sucks. Although soda's pumping it in there, so there's no there's no winning either way. This this job is gonna be fun. Alright, took the whole bottle. Occasionally, I'll get a junky outboard. Now, that junky outboard, usually the owner tried to get running before they junked it over here. So the first thing the owners do to get it running is put in new spark plugs, because that's always the fix. So whenever I see that, I save the spark plugs out of the motor. Which gives me a little plethora of brand new, never used, slash installed spark plugs. Ah, buy new ones. It's not that I'm cheaping out here, it's just that I forgot to get some new ones. So I'm using my little my little hoard of never used ones before. So upon disassembly, reassembly, I don't see any reason why that engine wouldn't start to begin with or now. So let's throw it in a bucket of water and see if it starts. All right, water is filling. Let's get our hose connected. Okay, water is at our minimum fill line, I'd say. I got the uh, throttle advanced past start over to fast because it never starts on start. Um, we shouldn't need choke, but let's choke it. Couple of pumps. Unchoke. So it hasn't started by now, it's not gonna. Well, the reeds look to be in good, good condition.
They really do. All right, put some gas in the intake. Is that smart? Carburetor is a controlled leak that allows gas to get into there, so in theory, this will do fine. Just gotta stand back. Not try to grab anything that gets up in the way. Let's see if it starts. Nope. Fuel pump works though. This thing's timing is so far out, it's not even funny. See these little notches? See this B? When this B comes to those notches, those points should open. So right now, they should be open, but they haven't moved. They don't move until right there. What is that, 20 degrees out? Top is the same way. This is almost to the point to where, so I'm getting close, that far away, that far away, point should move, they don't. They don't move, now they're open. That's, that's huge. On timing, that is huge. It ain't never going to run with that much of a gap. This is almost to the point to where somebody installed ignition components and gave no thought of timing at all. Now, whose fault is it? Mine for not checking? Or whoever did this before? Now, when I had the reeds off, I noticed screw marks on the connecting rod bolts as well as the crankshaft itself. So, <clears throat> why? It looks like a pretty low hour motor. Why was that a part? Maybe it was in for service and they changed the rings when they had to do something else. Who knows? Maybe it, maybe it was rebuilt and then they got to here and it didn't run and then I wound up with it. I don't know. But either way, again, you just saw where it opened. Look, look how far away that is. I don't want to go backwards, but that's where it's opening. That far. That's ridiculous. I should have the top cylinder right in time now. Because we're closed and right when we come to the two points, it opens right in the middle. So the top cylinder should be perfect right there. So I'm just gonna do the bottom now. Let's get a little closer. Pushing this in. All right, fingers crossed. Give it some gas, get some choke. better already. Give it, give it some idle there. So that is a little better. running so I'm happier now this this little stream of water that's our telltale if you will that tells us we got water coming out this is slowing down a little bit I think I need to adjust my needle a slight hiccup so I'm going to turn it just a pinch and give it a second So, 
I know these I know these indicator things are never accurate. So I'm trying to see how Boy, here we go. Dozen gear. I don't really want to empty my tank because it gets pretty crazy back there. I disconnected the fuel line, we'll let it run itself out of gas. Pretty ugly with that hood on. I mean, the body of the thing isn't really in, you know, great mint shape. Under the hood is pretty nice, however, so that's good. Tiller handle operates pretty nicely. It runs pretty well, and all in all, it's really not a bad little six horse. Somebody put a lot of time, effort, and money into the new ignition components inside of there, and it didn't, couldn't have run the way it was set up. So commend them for trying. They did a good job installing it. Everything in there looks great. However, it didn't work. So what happened? I'm kind of leaning towards somebody try to fix it, put all new ignition components in there. It still didn't run. They let it sit in the backyard forever. I got it, gave it its uh, routine maintenance slash checkups, saw the new ignition, ignored it, continued about my way, wasting all my time trying to get this thing running again when its underlying problem was right up there. I suppose the lesson I've learned from this is don't assume it's okay. Check it before you put the flywheel back on. Getting it on and off isn't that big of a deal when you have the tools, but it's still time and effort. And I don't know, just I should have checked it. Want to know the really crappy part? This screw that's holding on the throttle cam, pretty sure I forgot to tighten it. 